our service on this Lord's Day. We're deeply honored that you've chosen to join us and we hope that you will be uplifted and edified by this service today. We continue to remember each one of those in our prayers that have been affected by the coronavirus and we pray that this time of present distress will pass by quickly and that we will be able to return to some sense of normalcy as soon as possible. As we enter into our worship service today, Please give your attention to these words from Psalm 15. David says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Join me now in a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we come before you now with thanksgiving in our hearts for this great honor and privilege that we have of worshiping you today. Father, thank you for all the wonderful things you've done and continue to do for us, especially for the gift of your Son who left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross as the atonement for our sins. Father, help us to frequently take note of our spiritual condition and take whatever steps are necessary to remain in your loving favor. Father, we pray for those who are struggling at this time as a result of the coronavirus. Father, watch over them and bless their lives in all ways that you see fit. Father, we know that as imperfect people, we often sin and fall short of your glory. Father, forgive us of our sins and hold those things against us no more. Heavenly Father, be with us now as we worship you. May everything that is said and done today be good and in keeping with your will. In Christ's name, amen.
Sometimes we refer to the Lord's Supper as a communion. There is really only one passage that uses this term for the Lord's Supper. You can find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. In verse 21, it also refers to the partaking of or sharing or communing in the Lord's table. Communion means sharing, fellowship, partnership, participating in common. All congregational worship involves sharing in some spiritual activity. Let's consider some lessons that we can learn from this expression. In verse 17, though we are many individuals, we all partake of bread. Now partake is a fellowship or communion word. Since all Christians should participate in this same memorial, we share something in common with Christians of all ages everywhere. Sometimes people wonder if the passage refers to everybody in an assembly or in a specific local congregation. But Paul said, we all partake of that one bread. Now Paul was not a member of the church in Corinth, nor was he in their assembly. He was writing the letter because he was elsewhere. Nevertheless, he said he and the Corinthians all partook of one bread. But the same would be true of believers in other congregations and other assemblies elsewhere. And the same would be true of us today. As a matter of fact, even more so today. All we who participate in the Lord's Supper are sharing this memorial in common with other Christians around the world and throughout the ages. Whether we are gathered together or not, we are all one people. We all partake of one bread. We participate in this same memorial for the same purpose as all other Christians have done since the first century. Verse 16, the cup is the communion of the blood of Christ, and the bread is the communion of the body of Christ. The Lord's Supper is a memorial to Jesus' death, in which we share with the body and blood of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Obviously, this is not a physical sharing with Jesus' literal body and blood. Our sharing in the blood and body of Jesus is spiritual. Now, I know of no passage that teaches, as some may think, that participating in the Lord's Supper actually cleanses sins. Rather, the point is, is that we are memorializing the fact we have a share in the benefits of that sacrifice. Christ died on the cross for all of us. Verse 18 says that though whose sacrifices under the Old Testament were partaking with the altar, that is, by eating the sacrifice after it has been offered, they were expressing the fact that they had received the benefits of this sacrifice. So as children of God, we have received forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We remember in the Lord's Supper each first day of the week the fact that we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We memorialize the fact that we have a share, a communion, in the sacrifice by which our sins are cleansed and we have hope of eternal life. Now if you'll bow with me, let's say thanks for the bread. Most Heavenly Father, as we gather together as thy people, Father, we thank you now for this bread, which represents to us as Christians our Lord and Savior broken body on the cross. May those who partake of it now do so in a manner well pleasing in my sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray with me again, please. We continue our thanks, Most Heavenly Father, for this cup 
the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents our Lord Jesus shed blood upon the cross. May those who now partake do so in a manner well pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When 65 of the 66 books of the Bible had been complete, and the final book, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, being presented to the Apostle John was nearing completion, we find that only eight additional paragraphs of inspired literature would ever be handed down to man after this point. And it is at this time that God decides to present to his people a picture of heaven. In Revelation 21 and verse 1, we begin to see a description of this new habitation, this new dwelling place, this home of the soul. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is the Apostle John speaking. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more See, This first heaven and first earth is referring to where we are dwelling at this time. It's talking about this present reality. But the scriptures tell us that this reality, this earth, is destined for destruction. For we read in 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. In other words, what we see is this reference to new heavens and a new earth is referring to a new creation, a new habitation. And from what we find in the scriptures, this is referring to heaven. Heaven is our future home. And since this place is going to be dissolved along with all of the elements thereof, then we are still going to need a suitable environment for the soul to dwell for eternity. 
the Holy Spirit calls that prepared place, that place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us, a new heaven and a new earth. For it is intended to be a replacement habitation for this present habitation. You may remember the words of Jesus in John 14 verses 1 through 3. When speaking to his disciples, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. There we see this new creation. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So we see that this new heaven and new earth is in reference to the place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us, this heavenly home. Heaven is our future home. It certainly is going to be a very special place, a place where we will all be safe, a place where we will all be accepted, a place of rest, a place where the problems that we experience in this life will have all passed away because all of those things deal with the elements of this earth, those things that are going to be destroyed when Jesus comes again. In Revelation 21 and verse 2, it reads, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The purpose of using these words, coming down from heaven, is not indicative of a destination or a direction in which this place is coming from, but it simply is referring to the fact that it is coming from divine origin. As we've already made reference to, Jesus says that he is going to prepare this place for us. Well, where is Jesus now? He is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so this new habitation, this new holy place, this new Jerusalem is going to be coming from that divine origin. Therefore, it is coming down from heaven. But notice that it shows us that heaven is not an achievement of man. It is not something that we earn based upon certain merit, but it is a free gift of God. Something that God gives freely to everyone who are willing to accept the terms and conditions of that gift. Those who are willing to live that faithful Christian life. For we notice that the text says that it is, a it is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The church is the bride of Christ. This place has been prepared for the bride, for Christians to spend eternity. In heaven, though, we're going to have a new closeness. And this is what John makes reference to in verse 3, where he says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now certainly, we enjoy a special relationship with God today. We are aware of his closeness. We are aware of his love. We know that as we draw nigh unto him, he will draw nigh unto us. But in heaven, it's going to be different. In heaven, we will be much closer to God because we will be in the literal presence of our heavenly Father. We will be able to see his face. We will be able to converse with him. We will be able to ask him all the questions of all the ages because we will be in His presence, praising Him and worshiping Him for all of eternity. But then we come to a section of verses that many people take great comfort in the thought of. For we find in verse 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. What this is saying is that in heaven, 
God is not going to be drying our tears. So often the mental picture that people have is that of people sitting around crying and God coming around with a handkerchief and wiping their eyes. That's not the case. That's not what this text is saying. Very plainly, what Jesus is telling the Apostle John here is that in heaven, everything that produces tears in this life are going to be taken away. Death, sorrow, pain, disappointment, discouragement, all of those things are going to be gone forever. Because in heaven, we are only going to know happiness and joy and peace and comfort because the things in this life that bring us pain and sorrow are those temporary things. Things that are going to exist no longer in this new habitation. Now it may be that today you find yourself struggling. You may find yourself living with a broken heart. You may be discouraged. You may be depressed and worn out and defeated and feeling tired and frustrated with life. Maybe you're struggling with the pains of, of a relationship that you're in. Maybe you've been through a divorce that has caused a tremendous amount of pain and anguish for you. Maybe you're dealing with the loss of a job or the loss of your health or dealing with the death of a loved one. All of these things cause tremendous pain and oftentimes evoke tears in this life. How many times have we found ourselves crying ourselves to sleep at night because of some stress that is there? We think about what David said in Psalm 6 and verse 6. He says, I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Well, if this is the same type of feelings that you're having over the situations of life that you are going through at this time, then you can take great comfort in the knowledge that the very same hands that stretched the heavens, that the very same hands that, at that, that created all things that we see, those very same hands are going to take away every tear from your eyes. And the reason that is, is because in heaven there are no tears. Like the old song says, there are no tears in heaven, no sorrows given. All will be joy in that land. And that is something that we desire, something that we yearn for, something that we have to look forward to. Because we've all seen people suffer. We've all seen people struggle in their lives. We ourselves have struggled in many ways in our lives. We see people endure the pain of sickness and, and, and disability and disease. We see the struggles that they have in their physical bodies. But Paul says that in heaven, we're going to have a new body. A body that everything is going to work right. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You see, in heaven there's going to be no suffering of any kind. That means no heart attacks, no strokes, no cancer, no arthritis, no diabetes, no physical handicaps of any kind. In heaven, our bodies are never going to hurt. In, bodies, in heaven, our bodies are never going to age because we've been changed. And this corruptible flesh that we have embodied in this life is going to take on it that which is incorruptible. We will have that spiritual body, that glorified body for all of eternity. Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What Paul is saying is don't allow yourself to become discouraged and lose your faith because of the, of the difficulties in life that you may be enduring. 
He says, keep your sights on heaven and realize that the glory of heaven is so much greater than the momentary distress that we face in this life. In heaven, no one's going to get hurt. In heaven, there will be no crime. There will be no jails. There will be no missing children. There will be no killing, no wars, no unemployment, no taxes. There will be no hospitals, no pollution. There will be nothing corruptible of any kind in that place. Nobody will ever go hungry and no one will ever grow old. In heaven, we will finally be able to rest from our labors. And this is why in Revelation 14 and verse 13, John is delivered these words, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Yes, we do labor in this life. Yes, we do have pain. We do have difficulty. But what lies ahead is rest and peace and comfort from those trials of life. John also says that in heaven there will be no more death. Heaven will be a place where there are no cemeteries. You know, that's something that's hard for us to comprehend. There will be no funeral homes. There will be no tombstones. In heaven, the word goodbye will never be spoken because no one will ever die in heaven. But many are anxious to know, are we going to know each other in heaven? Are we going to be able to recognize those friends and those loved ones that we've had in this life whenever we get into the life that is to come? Well, I want to share a passage with you that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20. He said, For what is our hope, what is our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. Now my question is this. If these Christians who dwelt in the city of Thessalonica were going to bring joy to the Apostle Paul on the day of judgment by their presence with Christ, then how would this happen if Paul did not recognize who they were? If Paul was not able to see these brethren, know that these are people from Thessalonica, know that they were faithful Christians, then how would that bring him joy on the day of judgment? Well, very simply, it wouldn't. And how could they as well be his reason for rejoicing if he didn't know if they had made it to heaven or not? If he didn't know if they had remained faithful unto God, he would not be able to rejoice over this fact only if he was able to know them in heaven. We also have another reference Jesus said in Matthew 8 and verse 11, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So here we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven. And notice that it tells us that they have not lost their identity. That in heaven they still have the same identity that they had here on earth. Folks, in heaven we will have the same identity that we had here in this life. Moses and Elisha, or Elijah, they did not uh, lose their identity for when they appeared on the Mount of, of Transfiguration speaking to Jesus, they were recognized for who they were. They were not in the flesh, they were in their spiritual form. But yet, they still had their identity. In Luke 16, Lazarus, was still Lazarus in paradise. The rich man was still the rich man in torment. Samuel was still Samuel, although he was dead in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. And Jesus called Lazarus by name while he was still dead in the tomb. Even though a person has passed from this life and has gone on to eternity, it does not mean that they have lost their identity. And yes, friends, we will know our loved ones who are in heaven. We will be able to make new relationships with those saints of old. We will be able to renew old relationships with those that we have had relationships with in this life. 
But those relationships are going to be different. For the scriptures tell us in Matthew 22, verses 29 through 33, that in heaven that there will not be marriage, there will not be the kinds of relationships that we have in this life. In heaven, our parents will not be our parents, our wife or our husband will not be our spouse, our children will not be our children, but we will all be brothers and sisters in Christ serving our Heavenly Father. Now, in Revelation 21, verses 5 through 8, we read these words. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Now I want to notice this one more time because this is the whole key to our lesson this morning. And he that sat upon the throne, this is referring to God, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now what we see here is both a warning and a promise. A promise that heaven is going to be free from all ungodly influences. But it is also a warning that if we want to go to heaven, then we cannot live this type of life. We cannot allow these sinful behaviors. And of course, this is just a token few. We cannot allow our lives to be dictated by sin. We have to live a life of faithfulness to God. We have to abandon the ways of this world, for we cannot serve two masters. We cannot have dual citizenship, both in this world and in heaven. We have to set our sights on things above, and we have to realize that we are a part of a kingdom that is not of this world. But also, due to the constraints of time that we have, we're not going to read Revelation 21 verses 9 through 27. But at some point, I would like you to take a few moments and read these verses. For what we find here is the actual picture of heaven that John had revealed to him. And what we find in this passage is a breathtaking view of heaven. But also what we have to understand is that what John was seeing was something that human eyes had never seen before. John was seeing a place that is a new creation with no elements of the earth there. And so what John tells us in this passage is the most beautiful and most descriptive picture that he could give using human language. Heaven is going to be far grander and far more beautiful than anything that this passage tells us. But whenever we consider what is revealed to us, notice that it says that this city, that heaven, is going to be massive in size. It talks about furlongs. A furlong is approximately an eighth of a mile. So whenever we compare that with what the scriptures tell us, the image that John has revealed to him is about 1,500 cubic miles in size. Now that is the equal distance from New York City to Houston, Texas. That is a very, very large place. He also talks about the walls of that city. And he says that the walls of that city he gives us a measurement in cubits. Cubits are roughly 18 inches in length. And going by what he said, this means that the walls of this city are 72 yards tall. What this is showing us is that city enjoys perfect protection. Nothing evil can get into that place. For once the gates of heaven are opened and the faithful are allowed to enter in, and those gates are closed, then no evil influence will ever be able to influence that city. It talks about the gates of that city. The gates are made of pearl, single pearls, 
make up the gates of these places. Now a 20 grain pearl is about the size of the end of your finger. And today it's worth a fortune. But you think about a pearl that is large enough for a gate of a city with a wall that is 72 yards tall. See, it's hard for us to imagine. It's hard for John to describe the things that he's seeing because it is beyond our comprehension. He's witnessing things, as I said, that human eyes had never seen before. But what is being presented to us is an image that helps us realize how beautiful heaven must be. In Genesis 3, we read where paradise was lost. When man was driven from the Garden of Eden as a result of sin, paradise was lost. But what we find in Revelation 22 is paradise regained. For in the first five verses of this chapter, we find these words, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light for the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What this is saying is that heaven is going to finally complete this reversal of what happened in the Garden of Eden. God is bringing to fruition what he began to promise all the way back in Genesis 3, that man was going to be given an opportunity to be restored back to a full fellowship relationship with God in this sense. And folks, this is the ultimate fulfillment of God's act of creation to bring it all back to where he started. Heaven is a place where God is. It is a place where God's will is done. And it is a place where all of those who live the faithful Christian life and depart from this life in a faithful state will spend eternity. But sadly, not everyone will be there. A recent poll found that 87% of those surveyed believe that they're going to go to heaven. But the scriptures do not paint as rosy a picture as what this survey shows. For in Luke 13, beginning in verse 22, it reads, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand able, when or, uh, excuse me, be able to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know ye not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know ye not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Compared to the devastating number of people who take this broad way that leads to destruction, there are very few who are taking that narrow path. Very few are going to be saved. But still, the scriptures tell us that there is going to be a great number of people in heaven. For Revelation 7 verses 9 and 10 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. 
The only question that we have to ask ourselves today is this. Do you want to be a part of that number? If so, have you done what is necessary to make sure that your life is right with God? Have you considered your ways? Have you compared your life with the things that the Scriptures teach? Have you taken those steps to ensure that you are a child of God? This morning, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then we encourage you to turn away from your sins and confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We encourage you to contact us at the Pyburn Street Church of Christ or contact a congregation of the Church of Christ near you and tell them that you are ready to become a child of God. Make that confession of faith just like the Ethiopian eunuch did, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be baptized. Have your sins washed away, and the Lord will add you to the church. Or maybe you are a child of God, and you realize that you've not been living your life the way that you should. Then we would encourage you today to be restored to the faith. Contact your brothers and sisters in Christ and let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Make those changes in your life today that are necessary to ensure that heaven will be your home because heaven is a place that no one wants to miss. Would you pray with me at this time? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for this great honor and privilege that we've had of opening the pages of your word and learning from it. Father, we thank you for the promises that are contained therein, and especially at this time, we thank you for the promise of heaven, that gift that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And Father, we know that what we read in the scriptures about heaven pales in comparison to what that place is really going to be like. But Father, it makes us yearn to be there. And Father, we pray that you will help us all to use that as motivation to always put you first in our life, to always seek your kingdom first, to do those things that are pleasing to you. Father, as we bring this service to a close today, we pray that you will be with us in the week that lies ahead, that you will watch over, protect us, guide us always in your ways, and be with us until we're able to meet again to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.